So today we have Paul Dutton. Uh, Paul did his um, PhD um, in NYU with uh, Andrew McFadden. Then moved to, to Berkeley, well, mostly with uh, Emil Kudet. And starting the summer, he's going to be in the ITC. He's going to talk about um, using astrophysical problems that you can, uh, you can study with uh, moving mesh, in simulation mesh based on a moving mesh. So take it away. Thank you. Uh, welcome. Uh, I've never been to Toronto before, but I'm, I'm, I've been enjoying it so far. Um, so uh, today I'm going to talk about, uh, well, uh, moving mesh astrophysics. Uh, what I do in general is computational fluid dynamics for applications to astrophysics. Uh, so that entails a whole bunch of stuff. It first of all entails coming up with novel numerical schemes and then writing codes based on those schemes. Uh, and then uh, for solving the fluid equations or the MHD equations on the computer. Um, and then the other part of that is actually applying those to a wide range of astrophysical problems, everything from planets to gamma ray bursts. And I'll talk about a, a little bit about numerics and then a little bit about the different types of problems I've applied these codes to. Um, just because I don't like talks to be about one thing. So. Um, and so uh, all the codes I've written uh, use what is known as a moving mesh. Uh, for those of you who don't know what a moving mesh is, it's a mesh that moves. Uh, and uh, so in other words, uh, sort of more standard codes, the, the way you might think to write a code for solving the fluid equations is to build a sort of grid and to say, you know, you have specified that some, the quanti fluid quantities at each point on the grid and then evolve the, the fluid on that grid. But here, instead of having a static grid, uh, you have a, a sort of um, a bunch. Your, your zones or your computational zones are not these nice squares. They're these arbitrary shapes, in principle, that can move throughout the computational domain and change their shape and size uh, in order to follow the fluid. Um, and so, I'll show you an example of that. Um, uh, this is a well-known fluid instability known as the Kelvin-Helmholtz instability. Uh, so the color just represents density. So the red is high density and the blue is low density. So we have the high density fluid moving to the right and the low density fluid moving to the left. And you just introduce some perturbation and it grows and you get these, uh, these nice vortices that form. Um, and uh, the really cool thing about this is, you know, this has been, Calvin Helmholtz has been studied plenty before, but the, the really cool thing about this is you're actually, the resolution is very, very low. You're actually seeing the individual grid cells and they're not squares. They're, uh, in this case, they're polygons. They'd be, in 3D, they'd be polyhedra. Uh, and they're built by what is known as a Voronoi tessellation, which I'm not going to tell you what that is, but it's a, uh, it's a way of decomposing space into polygons or polyhedra. And, uh, and, but what's, what's amazing is not just the shapes, but that they're allowed to move to follow the fluid. So I'll show, even show you a nice little animation of it. Um, and the basic idea, there's a lot of different various reasons. You might hope that this captures the, 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 uh, captures the flow more accurately. Um, but if you, have, if you have a fixed grid, then you're passing fluid from zone to zone to zone, which is, in principle, a sort of a diff diffusive operation to passing the, passing the fluid from one cell to the next. And instead here, you're moving the fluid, to, the, moving the cell to follow, the grid cell to follow the fluid. Uh, and you, so you can eliminate that uh, diffusive operation and in principle maintain these stru structures that, you, that are at, at lower resolution and like this uh, contact discontinuity here, this sharp jump in density, uh, you can maintain very, with, to very high precision even at low resolution. Um, so that's the basic idea. But I'm actually not going to talk, this is a code I wrote uh, which is very general. Uh, it's a, a, um, it's called, I called the code test, but I called it that before I knew that there was going to be a, 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 a much more popular thing known as tests in astrophysics. But, um, but, uh, um, and, but it's, it's designed to fo evolve, to follow very general flows that can do arbitrary things. You don't know what necessarily what the flow is going to do at runtime. But for most astrophysical flows that we care about, we actually know a lot of what the flow is going to do. Uh, for example, disks, you know the fluid is just going to, most of the motion is just orbital. And that's the part you really want to subtract off. So for a lot of problems, uh, you, can, you don't have to use this fully general uh, thing. This is great for things like cosmology, because this is similar to what's known as the Arepo code, which was used very uh, effectively in cosmology to, uh, to, to ca capture galaxy formation. 
Uh, and there you don't know exactly what the fluid, fluid is going to do at runtime. But uh, for problems like disks, um, you may want to tailor your mesh, your moving mesh, to the flow at hand. OK, so that's my vague introduction. This is not a table of contents. Otherwise, you'd be in trouble. Um, but uh, all I'm, the only reason I'm putting in this much stuff on a slide is to let, because I'm here today and tomorrow, and some of you I haven't, I've talked to a little bit, but um, I work on a lot of different problems that I'm not going to be talking about today. So if you're interested in any of this, uh, you should, uh, you should uh, make time, find a spot in my schedule to meet with me. Uh, so I'm going to start by talking about numerical things. Uh, so the red underlined things are things I'm hoping to get to. Uh, I'm going to talk about this code I wrote called Disco, which is a code that was just spe specifically tailored towards disks. Um, uh, I'm going to talk about one application of that code to uh, gap opening and protoplanetary disks. Uh, I also work on the migration and eccentricity evolution of planets. I've done a, a bunch of work on that, but I'm not that I'm not going to talk about. That I'm very interested in. Um, I also worked on circumbinary disks, uh, and by circumbinary, I mean everything from where it's a stellar binary up to supermassive black hole binaries. Um, <clears throat> but it's a sim it's actually kind of a similar problem to the planet disk problem because you just is you just change the mass ratio. Um, uh, I've also done uh, work on the interactions, well, uh, supernovae in general, uh, but the interaction between supernova and some uh, circumstellar medium. This is a project I did with an undergrad, uh, Austin McDowell, who he was an undergrad at Berkeley. Now he's a grad student at NYU. Uh, and this is a supernova. It's hard to tell, but it's a supernova colliding with a disk. What you're looking at is a plot of pressure. So you're only looking at the shock heated regions. So the disk is down here, and the supernova is up here. And this is the sort of shock between the two. And it's the shock is sort of wrapping around the disk. This is where most of the action is, is right there. Um, I've also done work on uh, gamma ray bursts, in particular GRB afterglows, uh, and the dynamics of relativistic jets. So when you, after the initial burst of gamma rays, there's this, uh, uh, there's, that's the prompt emission. Then after that, there's this long extended period where we see emission across the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, that's the afterglow. Um, we're just still actually seeing the afterglow from the uh, neutron star merger event, uh, 72817. But, uh, so, but the, when you're looking at a GRB afterglow, what we at least we think we're looking at, it's a very nice problem. You're looking at the em emission from a shock, which is being pushed ahead by this jet. You still have a jet that's, co that's, that's, that's coming out and it's colliding with the surrounding medium. And it's, it, it's, as it sweeps up mass, it begins to decelerate and spread laterally. And the process of that, th that process is actually kind of a nice uh, physics problem that you can, that you can treat. It's, it, it's just a problem of just basically the dynamics of relativistic jets and how quickly they spread. And you can connect that directly to this observation of how this light curve decays with time, which is really cool. Uh, I've also done lots of work on fluid instabilities, in particular the Rayleigh-Taylor instability. Uh, those of you familiar with the Mesa Stellar Evolution Code, I've written a nice 1D model for the, to try to mimic the effects of Rayleigh-Taylor instability in 1D. Uh, if you're interested in that, you should talk to me. Um, and then I'm not going to talk about most of that, but I will uh, if I have time, if it's not totally used up by my introduction. Uh, I will talk about, uh, I get to work I've done on, this is a project I'm really excited about. It's a project I did with a grad student uh, at Berkeley. She's now an uh, Einstein fellow at Columbia, uh, Jenny Barnes. And we're, we did, uh, 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 this is on the connection between gamma ray bursts and supernovae, uh, particularly broadline 1C supernovae. Uh, so, all right. So let's get started. We'll get into the really fun numerical stuff first. So before I, I'm going to teach you all how to write a moving mesh hydro code. Uh, but before I do that, I first have to tell you, teach you how to write a fixed mesh hydro code. Um, so something like Athena. Um, uh, so I'm going to get rid of all of the complicated stuff, no magnetic fields or gravity or, uh, or uh, relativity or anything like that, just, uh, just Euler's equations. And all Euler's equations are, are uh, conservation laws, conservation of mass, momentum, and energy. And so they can all be expressed in this nice form, where u is some conserved density, and then f is the flux of that conserved quantity. For some reason, I decided to write the relativistic form of that there. I don't know why. It's an old slide. Um, but OK, so you start with, uh, they can all be written as these nice conservation laws. Um, 
This slide, all I wanted to take away from this is that instead of thinking about your grid, normally maybe when you think of a grid, you might think of a grid of points, and you'd say, d define what the pressure and velocity and density are at each point. But so how grid-based codes tend to work is you think of your, your space as being divided up into these cells, <coughs> which for grid-based codes would be squares or cubes in 3D. And instead of saying you have the you know, density, velocity, and pressure at this point, you say you, you specify how much mass, energy, and momentum is in each zone. And then if you want to evolve the fluid equations, you evolve them by moving mass and energy and momentum from each zone to its neighbors. And that way you can guarantee that conservation laws, the glo at least global conservation, is satisfied to machine precision. Um, and so this is what, so this is just, this is a little bit of notation. This is what a space-time diagram of a 1D hydro code at work would look like. So N represents what time step I'm on, uh, and I represents what zone I'm in. <coughs> and so my entire numerical scheme can be completely specified if, I, if I'm given all of the conserved quantities at time step N, and I want to figure out what they are at time step N plus 1. So if I can figure out what the quantities are at time step N plus 1 as a function of the quantities at time step n, that completely specifies my numerical scheme, okay? But that's not hard to do, because you just take the conservation law and then you do an integral. I don't know why I bothered to put all this math in here. It's just, an in, just, do, just, doing an in, just integrating this over this square. And then you write down the integral form of this conservation law. Uh, the only reason I put this math in here is to just, as a reminder, that this is, no approximations are actually made here. Uh, this is just the integral form. So suitably interpreted, this is an exact expression. All it's saying is the amount of mass that the, in this zone, the only way it changes from time step n to time step n plus 1 is if mass leaves by this phase or enters by that phase. Um, so my entire, uh, all of the approximations of my numerical scheme are completely given by how I calculate these, what I call fi plus half, which is the flux through this interface. All of my numerical approximations are housed in how I calculate that flux. <coughs> So once I specify that flux, that tells me how much mass, energy, and momentum is given to, from this zone to this zone over that time step that specifies my numerical scheme. So I've completely, so there's, and you can imagine there's a few different ways, actually, approximations I'm making here. One is I need to approximate, I need to, I know what, I'm trying to figure out what the flux is on this face, and I know what the quantities are inside the zone, and I may need to interpolate to the face. That's one approximation you may have already imagined I have to do. But actually, the much more important approximation is I have to figure out what is the time average flux over the course of, like I have to extrapolate into the future what this flux is going to be over this time step. That's the tricky part. But I've, uh, I've, so, but I've set up the problem in a way that it's completely tractable because all I'm saying is I have two zones here, one on the left and one on the right. It has some density, pressure, and velocity in this zone. I have some density, pressure, and velocity in this zone. I want to know in, as, extrapolate what this solution looks like into the future to figure out what the flux is. But what's amazing is that's, a, that, so that's a very well specified initial value problem which there are actually analytic solutions to. This is known as a Riemann problem. So if my initial, if I write down an initial value problem where I have some density, pressure, and velocity on the left and some other density, pressure, and velocity on the right and I specify it as a step function, I can, there's an analytic, I didn't, this is an analytic, you can kind of tell because it's not these little rounded corners. But there's an analytic solution for every uh, density, pressure, and velocity on the right and left. So I could, in principle, just write down what the analytic solution is. <clears throat> they all look sort of like this. So uh, what I'm plotting up here is density. At a, the initial density is this blue curve, and the red curve is at a later time. Um, and they all kind of have this, these same structures. This is the shock wave pushing its way into the right state. Here you have, uh, oh, well, here's your rarefaction wave pushing its way back into the left state, and this is uh, known as the contact discontinuity, which is just the initial discontinuity advected to the right. Uh, and this is what a space-time diagram of the Riemann problem looks like. So the density, right? the, uh, top one. This is just density, yeah. It, the, I, what, this is a particular initial value problem. There's also a d jump in pressure in the initial conditions <coughs> that I'm not showing. Uh, so this is a space-time diagram of the Riemann problem. So these blue regions are just the solution is trivial because no, none of these characteristics have hit them yet. Uh, and then here's your shock wave, here's your, uh, rare, here's your rarefaction, here's your contact discontinuity. And this here is the, the characteristic of the, of the face that we want to figure out what the solution is on that face. 
So in principle, what we could do is just find the exact solution, have that in our code, say, what, given these left and right states, what is the exact solution to the Riemann problem? Calculate that on this, inter on this interface. That, give, that gives me the flux, and that tells you how to update the, the system. Uh, so for many reasons, it's often the case that you don't, the exact solution can be either too cumbersome or for some systems of hydro equations, they don't know the exact solution. So there are lots of methods for coming up with what are known as approximate Riemann solvers for finding these. Uh, but either way, you have some way of calculating this, this. There's a very well specified way of determining, extrapolating this flux into the future. Uh, and then once you have that flux, that tells you how much mass energy momentum to pass from this cell to that cell. So that tells you completely how to update your, uh, uh, your, your system from one time step to the next. So now all of you know everything you need to know in order to how to write Athena. Um, but what, what about if your code uh, is not a nice grid? So this is an example of a code I wrote, which is specifically tailored to disks. It's a moving mesh, but it's not like the moving mesh I showed earlier with these arbitrary Voronoi cells. These are <clears throat> all, here are my computational zones are these sort of wedge-like annular segments and they're on azimuthal tracks, and they can shear past each other. So the grid has a non-trivial topology, um, and zones can have uh, thinner, fatter shapes if, if they want, um, and, they can, um, and, and, the, and the mesh can also change its topology because zones can move past each other. So how would you do hydro on a grid like this? Well, you still have a well-defined set of volumes, right? You, here's what your zones look like when I zoom in on them. You have a well-defined set of zone volumes, and so you can say how much, still say how much mass, energy, and momentum is in each zone. You still have well-defined faces. Uh, that's just anywhere where two zones are adjacent to one another. So these yellow faces are very easy to find. These blue faces are a little bit trickier, a little more bookkeeping to figure out where they are. In the, uh, in, uh, but, but they're anywhere that two zones are adjacent to one another. Um, and then all you have to do is go to each face. You can do the same thing. You can go to each face and find the solution to the Riemann problem on the face. That tells you how much mass, energy, and momentum is moving from this zone into that zone. That tells you how to change the mass, energy, and momentum of every zone from time step n to time step n plus 1. So that still tells, completely specifies your numerical scheme. Uh, the only tricky part is this, the faces can move. I didn't say how to deal with that. Uh, so these yellow faces, because the velocity, because the ears are on azimuthal tracks, they're moving like this. So the yellow faces uh, have a velocity normal to them. And so for those yellow faces, I have to do something different, or I make a couple adjustments. Uh, one is due to the fact that it's overtaking volume, so there's a correction to the flux. So if the velocity of the face is w, I just make this correction to the flux. I subtract off an advective component to the flux. Then there's the only other adjustment I have to make is within the Riemann solver itself. Previously, I said find the solution along this characteristic. Uh, that was just sitting here. Now I want to find the solution along a characteristic moving with velocity w. But that's straightforward to do f with, any, uh, with any given Riemann solver. So then uh, um, once you've made those two changes, now your code is a moving mesh hydro code. So that's everything you need to know to write a uh, moving mesh hydro code. So that's what you could spend your afternoon doing. Um, let me give you a few examples of things that it's useful for. Uh, well, this is a nice example that, to sort of show off what you can do, what, one of the advantages you get out of it. So this is going to be, it's, not, it's a movie that hasn't started yet, uh, a pressure-supported vortex. Uh, so it'll just be a stationary vortex, but I've added a passive scalar so you can see the motion of the vortex. And so on the left, I'm doing the, uh, I'm, I'm doing the calculation with a fixed mesh, so I'm not letting the zones move. And you can see, I can ca it's very low resolution, but I'm, and I can ca capture the motion of the vortex OK, but there's all this diffusion just because of the very low resolution. If instead I, I use a moving mesh and allow the, allow the zones to move, I can, uh, I get I, all this artificial diffusion is gone. In principle, I can main in principle, I can maintain these contact discontinuities to machine precision. If the face is moving with the same velocity as the contact wave, then, uh, then, then there's no mass being passed from, the zone, uh, from this zone to its neighbor. So you can, in principle, get rid of all of those diffusive errors. <clears throat> if I were to use a random, what do you mean by random? Like the one I showed you before? Yeah, that's the idea. 
you tailor your code to the problem you're trying to solve, right? If I were to use the code I showed you before with the arbitrary Voronoi cells, this would do much worse on that problem. You'd still actually, it would have less diffusion, but it would actually be much worse for capturing the orbital motion. Um, so it would be probably in, a little bit in between these two in terms of diffusion, but yeah, you definitely want, this is the whole point, is you want to tailor it to the, to the motion, to the problem you're trying to solve. Because there's a lot of problems that are just going in circles for the most part, and you're trying to capture the, some small correction to this orbital motion in a disk. So that's the idea, that's why I tailored it like that. Um, so, um, this is my most complicated slide, sorry about that. Uh, this is how you add magnetic fields into a code like this, uh, which it's, it's already kind of a mess to add magnetic fields into a grid-based code. Uh, the really simple way to explain it is, because, is, is that you need to maintain div b equals zero. This is actually much more subtle than that, but that's, that's all I'm going to get into it for the purposes of this discussion. <coughs> but, uh, how sort of standard grid-based codes solve this problem is they use something called constrained transport. So uh, what they do is instead of, uh, so in, within this zone volume, you still maintain this, the mass, energy, and momentum of the cell. Uh, but now the magnetic field is instead evolved on the zone faces. So you now have, uh, and you evolve a lower dimensional analog of the conservation law on the cell faces. So instead of the, uh, so now, so now I maintain it's, I, the total mass, energy, and momentum inside the cell, and then I maintain the total flux, the total magnetic flux through each face, and I determine how much flux is moving from one face to a neighboring face over the time step. Uh, in a somewhat analogous way, and I have to be careful because now I have flux that means two things. There's flux meaning the rate that something flows into something else, and there's the flux meaning the number of magnetic field lines per unit area, and then there's flux of a flux, which is the rate that magnetic field lines cross some boundary, which is also known as the electric field. Uh, so basically what I have to do, according to Faraday's law, um, but basically what I have to do is figure out what the, uh, that electric field, that flux of a flux is on each edge in this diagram. Uh, so every little edge, which is anywhere where two faces are adjacent. So that's a bit of a bookkeeping nightmare. But once I've done that, I can figure out how much magnetic flux is moving from each face to each adjacent face. And then that tells me how to update the magnetic field lines, the magnetic fields from one time step to the next. Um, and is it worth it? Well, what happens if you don't do that? This is what I call CT, that means constrained transport. That's the thing I just told you about, is if you turn that off and you just evolve these things naively, you can get horribly, uh, horrible instabilities, like the errors can grow exponentially and uh, your code crashes. And uh, the, grow fat, the errors grow faster the higher your resolution is. Um, although, actually, that's not the only thing that could happen if you don't do this. Though, actually, this is the best thing that can happen. The worst thing that can happen is uh, your code could not crash, but you still give you the wrong answer. <laughs> uh, and because uh, it, it can actually converge to the wrong answer if you don't maintain the divergence constraint carefully. Um, so, uh, so anyway, that's, uh, this is, uh, this is just checking that my code is now stable. Uh, I a, I'm wondering whether I should bother showing you a bunch of other code tests. This is just showing I can capture magnetorotational instability growth. Uh, and this is the nonlinear phase of magnetorotational instability, the fully turbulent disk, and showing that we get sort of the statistically averaged, the statistical uh, properties of the turbulence uh, in agreement with other studies. So, um, so after doing this, I'm satisfied that my numerical scheme is uh, correctly evolving the magnetic fields. Um, but it's very difficult to be certain until you've done really rigorous tests like these. Okay, so let's get to actual applications. Uh, the first thing I'm gonna talk about is uh, gap opening and protoplanetary disks. So we're changing, <laughs> changing gears a little bit. All right, so <clears throat> when the planets form, they, they form in a disk of gas and dust although I'm not going to talk about the dust, I'm just talking about the gas today. Um, and when they, get, they grow, they become massive enough that they can gravitationally interact with the disk. And when that happens, how, uh, what the interaction between the planet and the disk looks like depends on the planet mass. So if I have an Earth mass planet, this is what it looks like. Uh, I'm, I have a camera sort of orbiting with the planet, so you're not seeing the orbital motion of the planet. That's getting so you're just looking at the, uh, 
uh, there is, the planet is actually orbiting. I'm just rotating the camera at the same time. So, uh, so you're just seeing this nice spiral wave generated by the planet. And that's just a sound wave that's being sheared out by the Keplerian orbital motion. Okay, and this is just, the, for low mass planets like Earth mass, this is just a nice linear wave and you can calculate the, exactly what the wave should do just using linear theory. Uh, for now, if I put a Jupiter mass planet in, what happens? <clears throat> well, uh, you still get a nice spiral wave, but it's a very nonlinear wave. It shocks immediately. In fact, there's two shocks, one right there and one right there on either side of the planet. And they, uh, the shocks, rather than just being a nice linear wave that just propagates freely through the disks, the shocks cause the wave to dissipate. Uh, and whereas this wave just carries its angular momentum through the disk freely, this one, because it's dissipating, the angular momentum from this wave gets transferred back to the disk. What happens then is fluid elements in the disk are receiving angular momentum, and so they're being pushed out of the vicinity of the planet's orbit, carving out this low-density annulus, also known as a gap. <clears throat> uh, I don't know if I have to... Uh, this, uh, should, in this room, should I justify why gap opening is important? Uh, but, well, I will, anyway. Uh, it's important for a whole bunch of reasons. It's, uh, both for theorists, it's important because this should change things like the, how quickly how the uh, gravitational torques felt by the planet, uh, and so therefore it changes the migration rate of the planet. It should also uh, affect the um, accretion rate on the planet because there's not as much gas in the vicinity of the planet. Um, but actually, the really important thing about gaps is for observers, because we can actually see these th gaps in disks. Uh, so for a while, we've been able to see dust gaps in disks, but um, nowadays, we can even see uh, in molecular line emission uh, gaps and cavities in disks. And you can, when you see a gap in a disk, you can either look in the gap and try to f image a planet in the, in the gap, or you can not do that and just say you've discovered a planet. Uh, but either way, this is a way of discovering planets, a, t a different way of discovering planets in disks. Uh, and in fact, it's a way of discovering them th in disks, so as they're being in the formation process, so you're hopefully learning something about the actual formation process of the planet. Yes? In this particular setup, yes. uh, how sensitive is the torque on the planet to the aspect ratio of your annulus? I mean, is, there much, uh, is this wide enough that there's not much dependence of the torque on, on the size of your computational domain? Uh, in this case, in this example, I was just doing these to show uh, just uh, the, the, normally I have a much larger computational domain than this. But, uh, oh, so you're saying like if I, the, how sensitive is this? Yeah. You probably get about a factor of two difference if you add the, more of this. So yes, yeah, so this, wouldn't, this particular case wouldn't be good for calculating torque on the planet. Uh, I mostly did these as nice illustrations of the gap opening. What about the inner uh, that too can give you, an, uh, maybe not for Jupiter actually, probably around here, most of the actual torque is actually dominated by material near the, uh, near the, uh, near the, near Jupiter. Um, uh, but for, the, for, for these guys, you can actually get, uh, some of these other bits of the wave can actually, well, even this case actually probably, it doesn't give you an order unity correction, but you sh it's best to have it a bit further in. But most calculations actually, this is about, this is kind of standard to do about. Well, I, I understand that. Yeah, 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 yeah. The question is, uh, is you know, it, you say towards the inner boundary there, is it really good enough? It depends on the question you're asking. If I want to calculate the torque on this planet, yeah. me personally, I would put this about here instead. Okay. Uh, I, would, I would not do this for, to, if, I were, if I wanted to get a reliable pr thing that I believed the torque. Um, but, uh, yeah, but if you just want to know whether a gap opens, uh, that's, that's a different question. Um, the actual surface density though, I mean, around here, do I believe the surface density here because it might be affected by a boundary? That's also another question, but. Another great question. Yes. Was that? I have not, others, others have. Uh, I can, uh, ask me that question again when I have, when I tell answers. <laughs> um, yes? Oh, good. This is only uh, this is only a few orbits. This one takes uh, about a hundred. Actually, this is yeah. This is about a hundred orbits. Yeah, I think this is it up here. I think this is in orbits. So yeah. <laughs> uh, but this spiral wave immediately establishes itself on an orbital time. But then this gap opening can be much longer time scale. Um, okay. Yes. Uh, the, the, the 
transition happen when the field square is larger than the uh, scale minimum? What a great question. Why, do, why would you say, why would you, uh, why would you say, it's like I planted you in the audience. Why would you say that? Why, why the hill sphere? Because that's the only scales um, that you have in this problem, the two length scales. Those are the two length scales that I have in this problem, although I do have viscosity in this problem. So you could ask this question, if, uh, right, so the question that Almog is trying to get at is what is represented by this dotted line. How massive a planet do I need in order to open a gap? Now, if we listen to Almog here, it's you need the planet. Another way of putting what you just said is that you need, is, is I said before, you, this is a strongly nonlinear wave. In order to get the strongly nonlinear wave, uh, you, you need that because you, you need to form a strong shock in order to deposit angular momentum back into the disk. Otherwise, you just have a linear wave and it just carries the angular momentum freely through the disk. Um, and that, that strong sh shock criterion is the same thing as saying that the hill radius needs to be of order the scale height. Um, and so, so, the, so, so, the, so basically that happens around Saturn's mass for, these, for this particular disk setup. Um, but what I'm going to tell you is that that's totally wrong. Uh, um, and the reason is because I lied to you before when I said that this is a nice linear wave. Uh, you know, there's always some, it's, it's a very low amplitude wave, but there's always some amplitude to the wave. So even for a low mass planet, here, let me get a bigger example of it. Even for an Earth mass planet, this wave will propagate, uh, there will be some non weakly nonlinear contribution to the wave's evolution. So if I take little cross sections of this wave as I move away from the planet, and I look at them very closely, I'll see that they're slowly steepening into a shock as they move away from this planet. So now I'm going to say the really crazy thing, which is that even an Earth mass planet is capable of opening a gap. Because why? Because if a shock, if, if a shock will always form, no matter how low mass the planet is, then that shock will transfer angular, it'll dissipate the wave, it'll transfer angular momentum to the disk, very, maybe very slowly, but it will transfer angular momentum to the disk. And if these fluid elements in the disk are receiving angular momentum, those fluid elements have got to move. So now, even a baseball will open a gap in this disk, uh, if, it, if you're willing to wait long enough. Of course, wait, that's the, really the catch, is that you really, then you have to say how, how long, what are the realistic time scales that I have to compete with? So then uh, you could have, say the disk's lifetime is an obvious one, but a much actually more important one is the viscous time scale. So the real question is, can this gap open, how can this gap open faster than viscosity can refill it? So that's the criterion, not whether or not you get a nonlinear interaction. It's whether or not uh, it's a competition between the planet opening the gap and viscosity refilling the gap. This is, what, this is the whole thing I'm talking about in this first part of the talk. So I'm very glad you asked that question. <laughs> This, is a, this example is an isothermal equation of state. But the same basic things, these are, conser these are conservation law arguments, so they apply also to, uh, to, to, uh, to non-isothermal non equations of state. Oh, this is just showing off that I get captured the spiral really accurately. Uh, this, black, this curve is the predicted shape of the spiral. Um, and so now here's the nonlinear. Uh, so these, the first folks uh, to predict that uh, low mass planets could open gaps, that was Goodman and Rafikoff in 2001. And they did this using, oh, by the way, all these plots, what they are, are uh, the thing I alluded to before. If you take little cross sections of this wave as they move away from the planet, watching it steepen into a shock. <clears throat> and so Goodman and Rafikoff predicted that this in 2001, they did it using, uh, uh, semi-analytic theory, so they basically uh, predicted how this wave should steepen into a shock, uh, came up with an equation for that, uh, assuming a low amplitude. Uh, and then that was then uh, demonstrated by, first by Dong, Rafikoff, and Stone in uh, 2011, uh, using Athena, and they had a shearing box around their planet, so their entire domain was this big. I always make sure I draw it real small. Uh, but uh, they were able to show the, that the shock forms in the right place. Um, then we follow that up in a global disk, and we get the, you know, the same basic answers they get in a global disk, but the great thing about a global disk is that you can actually watch the gap open. So you can see for a low mass planet if, if a gap will actually open. So this one uh, is a 10 Earth mass planet after, I think, 1,000 orbits. 
And so you can see it's only just, this is the first example I ever did. This is only just starting to open a gap. It's only a 5% dip at this point, but it's just starting to do it. Uh, the reason I like this one is that these dashed curves are the uh, theoretically predicted position where the shocks are supposed to form. And that's, it, it, when it first starts to open, it actually opens as a double gap, right where the shocks form. That's where the, what's, that's where the gap starts to get cleared. Um, but this is not, this is maybe too tantalizing and not actually demonstrating it. So what I did then was after I, we published this result, I made some improvements to the code so it could run for longer. And then I uh, also added viscosity to the code at this point so that the planet has something to compete with. So this is going to be a movie of a uh, Neptune mass planet in a viscous disk over, I think, 10,000 orbits. And each frame is like 100 orbits, so the animation is going to look really choppy. But uh, you can see, if it takes a very, very, very long time. But if you wait, you, if you, it's not just if you, uh, it's not just about the viscous time. It's about how long you're willing to run your code for. But if you really run your code for long enough, you eventually see that a gap will open. Uh, and so this is a plot I made before I learned how to make nice-looking plots. Um, but they, this was. Uh, um, basically, these are trying to de demonstrate different gap opening criteria. So this is what y axis is supposed to be planet mass, and the x axis is supposed to be viscosity. And so uh, back, this is the this is actually exactly the criterion that you just said that uh, uh, that the hill radius needs to be bigger than the scale height. So and Lin and Papaloitsu, 1993, agree with you. They say nothing above nothing below this should be able to open a gap. We got plenty of planets able to open gaps below, the, below that line. Uh, later on, this is 93 though, so maybe, maybe we got better since then. Creed et al. came up with this criterion here in 2006. Um, but this one was also fundamentally based on the idea that there, you needed a, a nonlinear interaction. This, this is supposed to plateau out to here. Um, but we find lots of planets below that curve as well. And we find actually a much simpler scaling relation right here. Um, and it's, all it is is just given by the rate that the shock deposits angular momentum comp competing with the rate that viscosity removes angular momentum from the disk. It's a very simple criterion, and, um, and, uh, and it seems to work pretty well. Um, and, and fundamentally, we found no like, lower limit for how low a mass a planet you can, can open a gap as long as you're willing to run your code for long enough. But a lot, that's a lot of the problem that people have had is that they, don't, they run their, don't run their code for a full viscous time, and so they don't get to actually see the gap open. <clears throat> okay. Uh, that might be right. We didn't take that into account. Uh, there is a few different criteria that were put in there, but I didn't find. I found that. So this is this is the basic. This is actually Rafkov came up with this viscous criterion also um, in one of his papers, and that's the only one that seemed to matter for any of the stuff we do. Um, um, but I don't know. I, I, yeah. There were criteria about whether a wave reflects off of some inner edge of the disk or something, and, but I don't know. There's also criteria about whether or not viscosity dissipates the, um, the shock. But then usually you're above uh, the criterion where the gap won't open anyway, so, so I, I'm not sure. Right. Sorry, what? Yes. 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 So then you will change the steady state temperature there, but you won't change the angular momentum balance. You're still depositing angular momentum. It's not really going to, you may get a coefficient, a difference in the coefficient by a little bit, but you're not going to change the fundamental fact about how much angular momentum is being deposited. That's the really important thing. With disks, it change, I mean, we've looked at this. It doesn't change that much. Uh, I mean, the, with disks, angular momentum is everything, right? So, uh, you know. Um, in fact, by the way, here's, uh, here's another great example of that. Because what, what I realized at so a certain point is this, whoops, I went too far back. This here is everything we need in order to actually get a complete 
exp exp a description of the gap because they get Goodman and Rafakov tell us exactly where the shock forms, um, where, uh, where, where angular momentum is being deposited in the disk, um, right? Because the total torque being carried by the wave, the reason, the reason I'm pointing out this, the total torque being carried by the wave is a, not a very strong function of the, uh, of, the, of, the, uh, of the thermodynamics. There may be a factor of two or something, but it's not that strong a function. And that's what really matters, the one-sided torque, not the balance between the two, but the one-sided torque. And that's what gives you how much the, the gap depth. Um, and because all of that ends up getting shocked and dissipated. Um, but anyways, this thing tells us exactly where that angular momentum goes. It tells us where the shock forms and how quickly angular momentum is being deposited in the disk everywhere. So we can take this complete semi-analytic model and build a, a complete 1D model for the disk. So this is what I did here. And it works really well, incredibly well for um, shallow gaps. Uh, it's an unprecedented level of agreement for shallow gaps. Once the gap gets deep, then it breaks down because now, because Goodman and Rafikov is, 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 assumes a uh, weakly uh, nonlinear wave, whereas these become strongly nonlinear. But this is a great thing to start from to build, uh, to, to actually building 1D models of these disks. Uh, oh, I should have also put Jeffrey Fung's on here because he, he actually was the first one to actually explain this scaling relation, which we found empirically, um, but he, uh, but, but, uh, but what's amazing is this, this, this is this formula for the gap depth, where k is this combination of mass ratio, <coughs> disk aspect ratio, and viscosity, uh, works a, a wide, a, is very accurate across a wide range of, uh, of values of this parameter. So there's a whole bunch of different disks with different viscosities and Mach numbers. What was that? One more? Oh, good. What was that? If you go above thermal mass, yes. Can you always open a gap No. You can't. Uh, you, viscosity still limits you even if you're above the thermal mass. So this works here and it works here. We didn't demonstrate in this paper that it works if you go up higher, but it's been shown that that's true. That's an old result. There's only like viscosity. Well, you're definitely the fact that you're limited by viscosity is an old result. The scaling. It used to they used to think it was actually like this, but um, but but the fact that you are limited by viscosity is an old result. Um, but this, uh, I mean, even right here, we're actually um, you can the, we're actually applying to a whole bunch of mass ratios that are uh, above the uh, thermal mass. I don't know if I have a. I, I, it's hard to show you with this parameter, but. Um, so. So why what viscosity is Yes, but it's still true. So there, there are nonlinear corrections. Once because it's nonlinear, there are nonlinear corrections. So it's not perfect. But uh, it's still true. You're exciting a wave which has very similar amplitude. It's not really a wave anymore, but it's not like oh, it's definitely a wave. Oh, when you're in this hill sphere, you're right. It's not a wave. Oh, right. so you wave. But you still excite a wave. You still excite a wave. Even in the Jupiter mass case, you still excite a wave, sure. which sho and that sh the wave shocking is what opens the gap. So it's and th and that's what competes with viscosity. At least that's the picture. Maybe you don't agree with that, but that's what we find. Well, but these are also, I mean, these are things we've confirmed. Yeah, yeah. Now, you, know, you may also say 2D is not reality, and that's fine. We can get back to your question, which is these have been done in 3D. Um, they haven't been done, it's very hard to do low mass in 3D, um, but, but, we've, but the cases that we've checked, actually Jeffrey Fung did a bunch of these, to comparing 2D and 3D and getting identical. Like, I was surprised. I was expecting they wouldn't be perfect, right? But they looked like identical between 2D and 3D. Uh, and it's ultimately because uh, it's these, it's, these are, uh, moment, uh, these are um, conservation law arguments, right? You still have a certain angular momentum that's carried by the wave, whether you're in 2D or 3D, and that angular momentum gets deposited in that shock. Maybe the details of exactly how the amplitude of the wave may change a little bit, but um, but 
but uh, this is it's it all the same things uh, apply in 3D because the the real uh, the real radius of influence of the planet is not the Hill sphere. It's the si scale of this wave, which is on the order of a scale height. And so the, f the fact that you did it in 2D didn't matter because you still, uh, you still have the same, uh, the radius of influence is of order that scale height. Planets mass frost, just the amplitude of this wave frost as well. Yes. Because I think the question I'm interested in is high mass. Well, what's the thermal mass? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Well, it's highly nonlinear, but you still can be. It's, you're still competing with viscosity. You still have some finite torque that you can exert on this. Okay. <laughs> I would be willing to believe that it doesn't. The scaling isn't perfect, but it, 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 you're still competing with viscosity. Okay. Oh, I got five minutes to talk about gamma ray bursts and supernovae. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> I'll stay. I'll be on this slide for the whole five minutes. Um, so, oh, what was I going to say about them? Um, so, um, uh, right. So, um, actually, can anybody tell me? I've hidden. Uh, are there any supernova observers here? Is anyone who claim who can act like a supernova observer who can pretend they are? No. Nobody. All right. All right, Almag, you're the supernova observer. You're going to do great. It's going to be fine. All right, I've hidden a supernova inside of here, inside of this stained glass window. Where is it? Anyone else who wants to help him out can. So um, I imagine it's the jet break from the yellow is supposed to be the star, and then the white stream goes. That's, that's good, but it's too obvious. That's not where I've hidden the supernova. You have to think like an observer. What does an observer see? The spectrum. Oh, so good. That's so good. Excellent work. Excellent work. So good. So you since that's excellent. So can you identify the type of supernova from this spectrum? Well, I mean the excess, um, Not necessarily. You could just know what sort of, uh, you know, notice that these lines seem to be kind of smeared out. So, so or, or that I mentioned them at an earlier time in the table of contents. It's, it's, a, it's a one, <laughs> a, what type of 1C? It's a broad-lined 1C. Should have guessed because they have broad lines. Uh, so these lines are very broad, which means their velocities are very fast. Uh, typically, broad-line 1Cs have velocities, inferred velocity of order 0.1C, which is very fast. And, which, and so therefore, we have inferred energies of order 10 to the 52 ergs, which is very, very large energies. It's difficult to explain. So order magnitude bigger than typical supernovae. Um, the other thing we know about broad-line 1C supernovae is that they are the Oh, by the way, okay, good. Which one do you think this is? Which broadline one C supernova? Anyone have a guess? That's all right if you don't. This is 98BW. Should have guessed. Come on. 98BW is actually the most famous broadline one C supernova. It's cause that's how you all knew it. Uh, uh, it's, it's the most famous one because it's the first supernova ever detected co coincident with a gamma ray burst. Um, so nowadays we know that long duration gamma ray bursts are always associated with supernovae. Uh, and so if you, keep, if you see a long duration gamma ray burst and you look carefully enough, you can also see a supernova there. And that supernova is always a broadline 1C supernova. Sometimes we see supernovae that are not broadline 1Cs. Uh, and there's a few, re uh, sorry, sometimes we certainly we see supernovae that are not broadline 1Cs. Sometimes we see broadline 1C supernovae that don't have gamma ray bursts associated with them. There's a few reasons that might be. Uh, maybe the gamma ray burst isn't pointed at us, so we're standing over here and the gamma ray burst is pointed that way, but we still see the supernova. Uh, that's not actually favored very much for various reasons, but, the, but there's, um, it's also possible that sometimes, maybe, uh, that whatever mechanism is responsible for creating a gamma ray burst doesn't always succeed. Maybe it fails. So sometimes you get a successful jet that breaks out, and sometimes it doesn't break out. That's not so hard to imagine, because a GRB uh, is jet you can, is actually really tricky to get out of a star. You have this whole giant stellar envelope that you have to punch the entire, your jet all the way through and result in a nice relativistic outflow. And so maybe sometimes whatever mechanism is causing that uh, doesn't actually succeed, but you do still get a supernova. Maybe. 
Um, in any case, this is a project I worked on, and I have one minute to talk about with, uh, with Jenny Barnes, who was a grad student at Berkeley, and now she's an Einstein Fellow at, at Columbia, uh, on whether or not you can get uh, a broad line one C super, you can get um, a supernova generated from the, all, from the same engine that powers the jet, jet-driven supernova. So you, uh, the same engine that punches its way through the star, in the process of punching your way through the star, you impart a whole bunch of thermal energy into the star, uh, exploding it. Uh, and then the question is, can we do that? And also, when we look at that, uh, does it look like a broad line 1C supernova? Um, so uh, this is, I will really quickly talk about this, I guess. This is a division of labor. So I, I ran a calculation of a jet breaking out of a star. Um, and this is much like many folks have done in the past. but. Uh, and then what I would do is hand off this, the, uh, the, the stellar, uh, the, uh, the resulting outflow. Yes? Or why did the initial In this case, it was 0.1 radians. Uh, but th it does, yeah, that'll affect what happens. Um, uh, we haven't explored parameter space on this. Um, so this is uh, basically what I would do is then hand off the resulting outflow to Jenny, and she would run a uh, full uh, radiation transfer calculation on the outflow to determine what actually it would look like. Uh, so I'll quickly show a movie of this, and I'm going to start it and then tell you what you're looking at. So you're deep in the core of a star, and I'm punching uh, energy and momentum in small scales. This is log of density. On the right, I have an estimate for nickel production, which I do by saying any zone that attains uh, a, a temperature in excess of 5 times 10 to the 9 Kelvin, I, I I turn into nickel. Uh, and so then it punches, as we just saw it punch its way through the star. The init initial stellar size is about this big now. Um, it zoomed out a whole bunch. Uh, and, uh, but, now, but at this point, it's a nice homologous outflow. So why don't I rerun that again? Because I didn't get to talk. I didn't get to say what was going on. So we're, right now, we're deep in the core of the star. It's going to zoom out in a second. So now we're injecting this jet in. We're seeing this shock. This is all this thermal energy that's getting imparted onto the star as it, sh sh it comes out. And eventually, we're about to get to the uh, uh, edge of the star. Shock breaks out of the star. And then we have all this thermal energy. And so normally, when you do a calculation like this, most people care about this material. I didn't care about this material. This is the relativistic stuff moving at like, you know, uh, Lorentz factor of 30 to 100 or something like that. But what we cared about is this material moving at like 0.1c. Right, this is moving at the speed of light, so this is 0.1c. That's this material over here. So I would cut that out and hand it off to Barnes, and then she runs the calculation. Here's what our light curves in spectra look like. I'm over time, so I'm just going to move to the next. The last, very last thing is we uh, involved some observers, uh, uh, Maria Mojez and her student Yutsen Yu, where they took our spectra and uh, pretended they were real supernovae and tried to see what they would have classified them as using their classification software. Uh, and so these are sort of the two best, the way they work is they find sort of existing supernova that the lines match most closely. And these are some of the two closest matches. Uh, if you think that this looks too good to be true, you have good intuition. Uh, that's because um, the way this is done is you subtract off the continuum part from both models, and then you match the lines. And then we just ex added the same continuum back onto both. But the point is we match the lines really close. Uh, and so uh, this, there's, this would definitely have been classified as a broad line 1C supernova. Um, and I think that's all I wanted to say about it, but I rushed through it, so I can't remember. OK. The jet, that's a good question. So the tricky thing with this is we were hoping we could make the observer think that it was faster velocities than there were because it would directed more towards the observer. We didn't get that out. What we did get is we could put in a jet that was around 10 to the 52 ergs, and uh, this, but the, uh, sorry, the jet we put in, the injected jet is like 10 to the 52 ergs, and most of that ends up, ended up going into the supernova. That's not always going to be true. That depends on your parameters, but so this is sort of a proof of concept that this might be possible to work? What was the binding energy core of the I don't remember. But in this case, I actually wasn't. Uh, the binding energy is way lower than that, right? Well, but it, like. You know, as you increase the mass of the density, yes. it can be a, you know, 4 times 10 to the 51 or something like that, right? It can be pretty substantial. So. Yes. In this case. Uh, 
It was, yeah, it was, uh, it was even, I think it was even lower than that. But what, it was so low that we didn't even turn on gravity. Uh, and we just had, because, it, because the velocities in, induced by gravity would have been very small. It might have affected the details of like how much nickel formed because of that, but um, yeah. But so how, how have you gone through this process? How accurate do you think realistically these um, hypernova energy measurements are and the actually just take a spectrum of I Yeah, I was hoping we could show that they weren't accurate, <laughs> but we, we, we uh, so far, um, for example, it depends a little bit. For example, we did like saying, well, what, what would the lines look like if you viewed from different angles? They are a little bit broader if you're viewed on axis, but not that much broader. So you're not re it's not like it looks like a broad line 1C from one direction and a regular 1C from another. We never saw anything like that. I was hoping to. That would have been cool. But um, yeah. If that had been the case, then you could definitely have faked having a much higher energy Explosion, explosion. Um, other questions? Yes. Uh, can I ask you about the plan for the gap opening? No. Yeah, go ahead. So you said that um, from a time scale that you're really limited by gap opening, so this is time scale. Uh, but. Like for all these gaps that almost find me, where the planets have orbital periods of like a hundred, a thousand years, then if you're taking ten thousand orbits to open a gap, then now you are limited by the display. Uh, that's a good point. Is that um, I haven't thought about that. That may be. Right, 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 right. Yeah, you're right. The ones that are observed are much further out. So yeah, that's a good point. I haven't, I haven't even considered that. In, in, in most cases, most cases of observations, what we see is the dust. Uh, but some of them, I did mention the cases where talking about. Um, right. Yeah. Yes. Um, but in any case, yeah, no, that is a good point. The, if, if it's the lifetime of the disk is your limiting case, then what you could be looking at transient events, that things then, where the planet is trying to open a gap, but it hasn't complete because uh, it hasn't had enough, the, the, the high flame of the disk is too long for it to actually completely open it. Uh, but I hadn't even, I hadn't thought about that. Anything else? You guys look like you want to go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>